Hey everybody, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Having covered uh, natural sound and analog sound, now we're going to move on to the heart of the matter, uh, covering digital sound and its representations in the computer. Obviously we won't get to all of that this lecture, but we'll at least get a good start. I expect this to be a fairly long lecture, so I'd really encourage you to be prepared. I couldn't find any great way to break it up, so I'd really encourage you to be prepared to hit the pause button when you get fatigued and come back to it later. You don't need to watch this all in one sitting. Hope everybody's okay out there, and let's go ahead and get started talking about digital audio. So, um, the, the sort of key idea here is that an analog signal is a continuous signal. It's continuous in, you know, an analog signal is continuous in voltage. You can have as arbitrarily fine gradations in voltage in principle, and it's continuous in time. The voltage varies sort of arbitrarily continuously over time. In practice for analog, neither of these things are actually quite true and it gets complicated, but to a good first approximation, that's the state of things. And that sounds fantastic, but it turns out that computers aren't very good at working with continuous things. They're digital. And so what we're going to end up doing is discretizing the audio signal into something called samples. And then we're going to work with the samples inside the computer. Um, this isn't the same use of samples as in you know, hip hop or whatever, it's uh, it's its own thing. And then we will turn those samples back into analog um, to get them back out. And there we are, that's digital audio, we're done now. Okay, we're not done now, but that's the plan. So, you know, what's a sample? Well, I, I have this graphic that I think is a really nice description of what a sample is you'll notice that you've got your continuous analog input here. And what you do is you pick some times and you measure at those particular times uh, what the level of the signal is. And you record that as a number. And so, you know, your digital output, quote unquote, is gonna be a measurement of, oh yeah, right here, this was the signal level. Right here, this is the signal level and so forth. And yes, you usually sample with regular spacing. There's some tricks you can do that involve not doing that, but I've never really worked with them. Almost always there's a regular time interval at which you sample. And yes, you're going to uh, discretize those into numbers represented inside a computer. So they're not gonna have arbitrary precision, but they'll be good enough for what we wanna do. So that's the basic ideas. Let's turn our sound into samples. And the rest of this lecture really is just details of that concept. So, you know, it's the simplest to use a uniform sampling time, and it turns out to work really well. There's a lot of nice mathematical things we can do with that. And, you know, again, it's simplest and almost always fine if you go deep enough to use some fixed size binary representation of sample values. Your, 8-bit integers signed and unsigned, your 16-bit integers signed and unsigned, your 32-bit integers signed and unsigned. Actually, audio works with 24-bit integers a lot because of reasons. And, you know, floating point numbers are also a thing. 32-bit um, or 64-bit floats. And, you know, it's tempting. It's pretty clear from that diagram we saw that the more often you sample, the more accurate re your representation of the signal is. And the more bits that you use to record your sample value, the more accurate your representation of the signal is. But obviously there has to be some limit to that because we only have so much time and so much memory. And obviously it's a little wasteful if your thing is a 60 hertz sine wave you know, or 60 hertz square wave, let's say, you know, to, to burn a lot of bits on it. But there you go. We're going to try to find some compromise. So this is just classic engineering is to try to figure out what compromise works here. This technique is often called pulse code modulation because reasons. Um, you take, you sample as though they were pulses and you code, <laughs> excuse me, code your output values. 
and that's almost always what you use as the time domain digital representation of a sound inside a computer and this is this is just very very standard and usually the number representation is very simple you measure the voltage or whatever and you turn it into a number directly but as we discussed earlier on you know very loud sounds may the differences may not need to be represented as accurately as the differences between smaller sounds and so you might get some efficiency some very very simple compression uh by using some function to transform the voltage a log function or something similar and storing that and working with that inside the computer that's a thing that's done a lot in transmission uh early digital telephone systems did that so why why do this well because we want to work with computers but why do we even want to work with computers there's some other advantages and even systems that are purely electronic systems that don't use a real computer at all often discretize sound they often discretize in time and space a big reason to do that is noise immunity if i am rounding the voltage values up or down then small changes in the voltage value mostly don't matter and if i am taking samples at regular intervals then variation between those intervals don't matter and so the immunity to jitter and noise is quite a bit better that's a thing more importantly once i've got this thing as a sequence of numbers with a computer i can store it perfectly i can put it on a disk drive or whatever and it will stay there for as long as that disk drive survives which is a long time perfectly intact and with zero variations i can transmit it perfectly i can make a perfect copy of the sound and all that stuff all the loss you take is at the point where you discretize and after that there are no losses in your internal system and that's great if you know your system is loss prone to and obviously the big thing is that you know writing computer programs for a general purpose computer to manipulate sound is way easier than building custom analog electronics to manipulate sound and so we really need to get the sound into a representation that we can write general purpose computer programs for it turns out that uh that if you can work with these sound samples with a very very small computer something like this little long end nano that i have on my desk that costs five dollars and uh you know has very little memory and a cpu that i think is 60 megahertz uh is plenty fast and has plenty of ram to do a lot of really clever things with audio and so a very cheap simple microcontroller can replace a lot of fancy custom analog electronics in a system like this and so even hardware-ish devices are mostly going to digital manipulation of sound these days and the last reason to continue my bad joke from last time is that the audiophiles absolutely hate this for whatever reason they've decided that this whole business of taking all the losses up front and discretizing wrecks the sound in hard to define ways and good for them i guess but it means you don't have to think about them much when you're doing this that's kind of cool so there's an important thing to understand here which is that like we've said a bunch of times thinking about sound in the time domain is really kind of a bad idea a lot of the time because sound is fundamentally or at least most of the sounds we work with are fundamentally about frequencies and you know the PCM sampling is done at regular intervals as though um you know what's important is the time domain and it turns out there's that's problematic in frequency space uh one of the things that you have to worry about is sort of what's the maximum frequency you can represent and to understand that you have to look at something called the nyquist limit 
Um, and the basic idea is captured really nicely, I think, in this graphic, which is floating around a lot of places, but here's a version of it, which is that, imagine that I've got some sinusoid that I'm trying to sample, and I've decided to sample at regular intervals. And in fact, the interval I've decided to sample in is half, you know, one sample, you know, two samples per cycle. I'm sampling at half the um, frequency double the frequency sorry so I'm getting two samples for every cycle and you'll notice what happens in that situation I might catch the peak of one and the trough of the other now this is if I get lucky right if I sample at half the frequency and am shifted over a little bit with respect to the phase of the sine wave well I'm gonna catch sort of lower here and lower here and I'm gonna catch sort of uh, the same thing on the other side I'm gonna catch this sample is going to be uh, shifted lower and this one's going to be shifted lower and since everything's symmetric um, everything gets close to the origin and depending on the phase of my sine wave I might hear it at its intended volume or I might you know I might capture it at its intended volume or I might capture it at a volume of zero if I'm super unlucky those samples end up right here on the axis and I measure everything as zero volts every time I measure, even though there's a perfectly good sine wave on the analog line. And if you sample even less often than that, things get even worse. If you sample oh, at a third the rate, you know, and uh, the you know of the th thing then of the sine wave two-thirds the rate of the sine wave then you'll notice that things hit in kind of an interesting way these samples hit at points that sort of look like they form their own sine wave and so what I'm really gonna see when I measure those samples is I'm gonna see something that looks like a sine wave at the other rate at a, at a lower rate and so that's no good that's called aliasing it's essentially a folding effect the more that the frequency of a sinusoid that you're sampling is above twice the sample rate um half the sample rate the more that sorry all the halves and twices are really confusing it takes a minute to eat your head around it the more that you're not sampling fast enough the worse these aliases are shifted back into the spectrum and so it turns out that f provides a fund li fundamental limit on how fast we need to sample to recover a signal. If we want to recover a signal with 24,000 cycle per second sine waves in it, we have to sample at 48,000 samples per second. If we sample with any less, we run the risk of getting back a signal that's just wrong with respect to what we did. And of course, because superposition this isn't just a thing with sine waves because we can think of any repeating signal as we've said before as a sum of sine waves and so if any component of the signal if any one of those sine waves that you sort of add up notionally to make the signal is above uh, half the sample rate then you're gonna get aliasing and so that's a problem and it's a problem we're gonna run into here once in a while and you have to kind of pay attention. So this is one of the downsides of the sampling plan, of the discretization plan in time, is that you'd better sample fast enough to capture stuff that's in there accurately enough that you don't confuse yourself mightily. So, we need to assure that, yeah, so, we, yeah, we'll be talking about that again and again. So we get the basic idea. We're going to sample at at least twice the highest frequency encountered as our sampling rate. We're going to discretize accurately enough that we get a pretty good measure of what the vol in voltage accurately enough that we get a pretty good measure of what the voltage is that we're you know, sampling. And off we go. So... How much is enough in frequency? It's an excellent question. Uh, notice, first of all, 
sample rates are, you know, the units here are samples per second. And that's important because there seems to be a sad confusion in the literature between cycles per second and samples per second. And obviously, as we've just talked about, they're off by a factor of two from each other. So I'm going to try to be really careful in this course whenever I talk about sample rates to say samples per second, which is not the same as cycles per second. So it turns out that a good number that has been used for a long time is sort of roughly 22 kilohertz gives you a reasonable sampling rate. And that number is magic because back when compact discs, which were sort of the first popular digital audio storage medium, were being standardized, they chose, and I'll give you a couple trivia points if you can figure out why they chose this exact number, but they chose a sampling rate of 44,100 samples per second. And so that means that the maximum sound, you can, frequency of sound you can represent in a CD is a 22,050 hertz sound. And that's okay. We've already talked about the limits of human hearing. You're not really going to hear much of anything at 22,000 hertz. That's essentially ultrasound. Uh, there's a more complicated story to be told here, and we'll talk about it a little today and more later in the course. But that that is a standard number. People have adopted that number because, hey, CDs used it. It must be okay. Um, unfortunately, that's pretty fast. And especially in the old days when hardware was slower and memory was more expensive, it was tempting to say, well, maybe we don't need that much. And so if you look at old analog equipment, uh, guitar stop boxes or whatever, a lot of it was really limited quite a lot lower than that. Uh, the highest frequencies that they would pass through, even these analog electronics, were around 12 kilohertz. And 24,000 samples per second turns out to be a convenient round number for programming purposes. And so that's another real common sample rate that you'll see around in the business is 24,000 samples per second. Even consumer stuff now that you buy is likely to be faster sample rate than that, but there was a time when sort of 24,000 samples per second was a very common thing to find in consumer audio equipment, and I think you still can. Um, and there's a rate missing here, so I'll have to remember to amend my notes. For reasons... There's a couple of reasons why you might want to sample a little faster than 44 100 hertz. One of them is that it isn't a nice round number, and you really might like a nice round number like 48,000. And so 48 kilohertz is another really common sampling rate that should be listed on this chart. See, one of the things these ones that go way into the ultrasound do is they give you some room to mess around with screwing up in the high frequencies. And later, in this course, next week in this course, when we talk about frequency domain stuff, you'll see why it's nice to have a little headroom, nice to have a little band up in the top of the frequency space that you don't actually care about. And so it's pretty common to try to sample a little faster than the highest frequency that you want in the signal. And 48 kilohertz works well for that, and 48 kilohertz works well for clocking digital systems. And so you'll see that as a really common sample rate. Your PC probably has all its audio stuff to work up at either work at either uh, 22 kilohertz sample rates or four, oh, sorry 44 kilohertz kilo samples per second rates see I'm already doing it 44 kilo samples per second rates or at 48 kilo samples per second rates so those are the really common rates in most modern hardware so we get that we get 24 thousand samples per second we also get the the when the telephone companies changed from analog to digital transmission a long long time ago they were building all custom digital hardware to discretize they wanted to discretize for some of the reasons we talked about they wanted to be able to fit more phone conversation more than one phone conversation onto a single phone line which you're not going to do any convenient way in the voltage space. There are ways, but it's not nice. And they wanted to be able to get rid of noise problems, which have been had plagued telephones since its inception. And so they decided they would go to digital PCM 
systems. And they chose a rate of 8,000 samples per second, which gives you only the maximum signal you can record is only 4 kilohertz. But remember, we've heard of 1 kilohertz tone, and it's a pretty high tone. And it turns out for voice, really, you're going to have no problems understanding most people's voices if we if you get rid of everything above 4 kilohertz. And phone was, was and is mostly about voice. And so they used a lot in 8,000 sample per second rate. And that's kind of stuck for really cheap, cheesy stuff. You know, it's a lot less, right? Compared to a 48,000 sample per second rate, that's one sixth of the samples per second, which is a lot less to deal with. And so it's kind of nice. But if you're trying to listen to music and you're trying to listen to it rolled off at four kilohertz, you're not going to like it very much. So when I refer to telephone around here, I'm going to probably accidentally use the acronym POTS, which is the plain old telephone standard. Um, and uh, that's, that's just sort of an industry acronym. So get used to that. Plain old telephone system. So that takes care of sample rates <laughs> for some mild definition of takes care of. What about sample amplitudes? How do I measure these things? And the obvious thing to do is the thing that most people do. They round the measured voltage to some integer representing some fraction of it, and they record that integer as the sample value. Uh, the There's a sort of standard problem to begin with. Do I mean signed integers or unsigned integers? Should the voltage be around zero like it would be in a lot of electronic systems or should it be always positive so that zero is zero volts and you know 65536 is 6.5536 volts i guess and both are in common use so that's a thing that you've got to watch out for as far as dynamic range again the interesting question is how loud can a sound get before it doesn't matter anymore and how soft can a sound get before you can't hear it anymore and it turns out that a 16-bit sample which is not all that big is really plenty even for music and so there again the CD people said we're gonna go with 16-bit samples and a lot of people copied them that's probably the most common sample size floating around is 16-bit signed or unsigned integers. Having said that, 8 bits isn't that bad. I, I, I want to try in a, a little thing here. This is a thing you may have heard me play before and you'll probably hear me play again in this course because uh, I've been using it as a test tone since Linux was a pretty much brand new thing. So let's go ahead and listen to this. Hello, this is Linus Torvalds, and I pronounce Linux as Linux. So that was an 8 bit per sample, 8,000 samples per second audio file, a recording of Linus Torvalds himself pronouncing uh, Linux. He doesn't pronounce it like that anymore but he did then he doesn't pronounce his name as Linus anymore but he did then and you can hear that that was fine for voice but you can also hear the distortions and inaccuracies in it one of the tricks that was used with that this was by the way something that I think was originally recorded on an old Sun workstation and it's audio hardware which it had audio hardware, which was cool, not everything did, but its audio hardware was 8-bit, uh, 8,000 sample per second, and it was what's called ALA or MULA encoded, I think MULA encoded in this case, which is this encoding I was talking about earlier, where you actually encode things non-linearly, the samples, the the voltage that you're recording isn't linear in the sample amplitude and that lets you fit more dynamic range into an 8-bit number if you if you're going from minus 128 to 127 
you'd like to have more dynamic range than linear eight bit numbers give. And so you, like I say, take logarithms essentially. And so that's great for terrible stuff. And that again is what the pot system used, what the plain old telephone system transmissions were done in. They were done in eight bit Mula encoded in the US and a law encoded some other places samples that was the plan so and old video games were also typically 8-bit and low sample rates 8,000 samples per second wouldn't be unusual because on old 8-bit terrible hardware that was kind of a lot remember memory used to be really difficult and expensive to get and speeds were not high of anything and so you really wanted to work with less samples that were smaller and that was a thing and so that characteristic 8-bit sound that you hear in super mario well now you know why it's called an 8-bit sound and yeah the sample rate's really low too now one of the things i've sort of danced around but probably should say something more intelligible about is well, wait, but you haven't really actually defined your units. You haven't described what voltage of audio is going to be converted to 128 in a, sorry, 127 in a 8-bit sample and what voltage is going to be converted to minus 128. And that's absolutely right. That's super, super common that the uh, only, there's, on, there's only the vaguest relation between the voltage coming in and the number other than relative. It's all just relative units for the most part. And so you gotta be a little careful. There's a real common, there are a couple or three real common standards floating around the analog world for how much voltage corresponds to how much output amplitude from a speaker or input amplitude from a microphone. Those units are dramatically different typically because a microphone typically needs a lot of amplification and a speaker is gonna be less. And so there's sort of this notional nominal one volt peak to peak thing floating around or two volt peak to peak thing floating around. There's several other standards. So sort of, you can sort of think that a maximal sample might correspond to a volt or so, and that volt or so might correspond to a maximal excursion of a speaker. But the standards are all over the place. The units are really not very well defined. And what we typically do once we've got a digital audio sample is we just ignore the units and say, well, it's scaled from some minimum to some maximum. And then when we stuff it back out, we figure out what you know, either up with analog hardware or with digital scaling right at the end, what are we gonna do with those samples to make them the amplitude we need for th the right thing to come out the speaker or whatever. So that's great if what you're building is some modern version of the telephone. If I was building a fancy system that didn't really have any interesting computation in it, I might choose 16-bit 44 100 sample per second audio and call it a day because and that's essentially what the C cd people said they said well we're not going to actually do anything with this sound digitally we're going to get it off a cd and stuff it to some analog hardware that's going to make the speaker move and there's not much in between and going the other way yeah we're going to record a cd we're going to get a bunch of fancy analog hardware and then sample the signal to that rate and stuff it onto the CD. Not much is in the way digitally. And it turns out that numbers that are good enough for that are maybe not enough to do a good job of actually processing the audio internally. Like I said before, you really want to have some headroom in frequency. So you really want to sample quite a bit faster than the highest frequency you expect to be in your signal, because that gives you some room for digital algorithms that we'll look at later to sort of screw up in very high frequencies that are 
going to be ignored anyway on the output and that you couldn't hear if they weren't. And so it's not uncommon in modern systems to leave a lot of headroom, 96,000 samples per second instead of 48,000 a thing. So that would notionally correspond to almost 50 kilohertz of bandwidth, which is pointless from a hearing point of view. You can't hear 50 kilohertz even a little. It's just literally you're deaf to it. But that gives you a ton of headroom for audio processing algorithms. And so people use it for that reason. Also, people who don't know anything, bigger numbers are better, right? And this is classic in images. It's classic in video. It's also classic in sound. And so you'll hear a lot of people say, well, a 48 thousand sample per second rate is not enough. I need a 96,000 sample per second rate. Yeah, whatever. And similarly, when you're doing internal calculations, doing them with 16-bit integers, there's a lot of opportunities to screw up. If you're exponentiating a signal, for example, which is something you might want to do, if you're taking each sample and taking it to the 10th power, well, that's not happening in a 16-bit integer. There aren't very many values you can raise to the 10th power that fit in a 16-bit integer. And so it's really common to actually convert really from a floating, from a take your samples that come in with at whatever integer thing and work with them internally as floating point numbers scaled to some range. The common scaling range is there again, do you want signed or unsigned? It's either between zero and one or minus one and one, but that gives you a dynamic range of 10 to the 30 for floats and 10 to the 100 for doubles, which is enough dynamic range for sort of anything you want to do. And it gives you more graceful degradation, right? The sample coming out, you know, as you make these calculations, it's really only going to be off by a lot if the samples are very large because the floating point numbers are closer together when they're smaller. And so uh, for internal calculations, floating points a thing, and I can highly recommend it. Doing a lot of the algorithms we'll look at later in the course with any kind of fixed size integers is just like, oh, please don't do that to me. By the way, something I forgot again, but I should mention is that for this reason as well, for integers, if you're going to represent your signal as integers internally for calculation, again, it's common to leave yourself some headroom and use 24 bits. And so you'll see 24 bit audio systems floating around, which is clearly an awkward number for a computer to deal with. Three bytes of signal doesn't round well and doesn't work evenly. A digital signal processor I worked with ages ago actually had a bunch of 24 and 48 bit registers precisely because it was designed to work with audio and well, and so it would do calculations at those precisions. But you see less and less of that. Really, modern hardware floating point is available and fast typically. And even if you're doing soft floating point, it's kind of crazily fast on a modern microcontroller. And so, meh, nah, let's just use floating point numbers. All right, so that's the basics of pulse code modulation. That's the basics of what we'll be working with for the rest of this course. So now you've got these samples. How are you gonna store them? How are you gonna transmit them? How do you wanna organize them? And there's really the one true organization method, which is, first of all, something that's easy to forget that we talked about long ago, earlier in the week, is that in most applications, you're not dealing with one audio stream. You're dealing with two. You've got two wires carrying voltage. Why? Well, left ear, right ear. Our hearing is stereo. And uh, because of that, you want to typically carry around your samples in pairs at least, right? And in modern audio systems, you may have way more wires than that. Uh, home theater systems are often 5.2 or 7.2, meaning they have seven or nine channels of audio 
because you want to have different speakers in different part of the room carrying around slightly different things. And so the most common format for transmitting and storing that is to just give up and group samples into something called frames. And so you say, well, you know, I know how many channels I'm working with. Usually it's two. And so I'll, instead of working with samples, I'll work with pairs of samples, each one representing a sample on the left channel, a sample on the right channel. And like we've talked about before, you may choose to represent that as a sum and a difference with less accuracy to save space. But if you're working with 16-bit channels anyway, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of greatness to be had in that, right? You can imagine sort of working with an, a 16-bit average and an 8-bit difference channel, but now there again, you're back to 24 bits. So let's not do that. Um, so you can sort of think of it as like this. You've got this these pairs of samples representing your stereo signal and they're organized into frames and each frame you transmit has two samples in it or that you store has two frames in it. But these pipes, the, the vertical bars that represent the separation, they aren't there, right? The signal is transmitted or stored as just sample, sample, sample. And something else needs to know how many bits are in those sample, each sample, what the bits in that sample represent, and how the samples are organized into frames. So a lot of this is implicit, right? The sample rate's implicit. How fast were these samples taken? The frame size in channels is implicit, right? Were these really, I, I got them, all this information's been erased. Is this really stereo or mono or 7.2? The, what order? Uh, is the sample, are the samples within the frame? Is this the left channel and the right channel or is it the other way around? Typically, clearly you would transmit the left channel first, but meh, it's a Western convention. And, oh, and endianness. Oh, endianness. We've got 16-bit samples and there's sort of two ways, even if we have 16-bit integer samples to represent a 16-bit integer, right? We can have the low 8 bytes followed by the high 8 bytes, or, or bits, I mean. The low 8 bits followed by the high 8 bits, or we can have it the other way around. And it's not uncommon to see either in the business. So, so with all this stuff implicit, you sort of have to have some metadata floating around somewhere that tells you how to interpret this stream, literally the stream of bits sometimes, but almost always at best a stream of bytes that's coming at you that represents some audio. And for transmission, you typically don't want to ship metadata around because it's a pain in the neck. And so for simple digital audio, PCM audio transmission, what you typically have is a standard, an external protocol of some kind that's defined that says, yeah, 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 it's like this. For storage, you sort of want to record those parameters so that you know later after standards have changed or somebody did something weird exactly what's going on in here and so what you typically do is you make a header full of fields that say what all these things were oh this this audio is a 48 thousand sample per second thing um it's two frames per sample the sorry for two samples per frame the frame order is, uh, you know, left to right. The sample size is 16 bits. The sample endianness is little endian. The thing's unsigned integers, that kind of stuff. And you stick that in a header, and then follow it by your sample stream. That's just a really common way to do it. That's done by a lot of different audio formats. So that's the basics of PCM, and. In a future lecture, we'll look at fancier things for storage and transmission for PCM. In particular, we'll look at compression. But first, we want to dive into the world of the frequency domain. We've danced all around this idea that maybe a better way to think about audio is as frequencies rather than as samples. Well, starting uh, next week, we will poke real hard at that idea and see how far it takes us. But before that, I do have one last mini lecture to give you, and that's the one where we talk a little bit about this process. One of the things I've been very vague about is,
I talked a lot about how you convert a sound to a voltage or a voltage to a sound. Well, how do you convert a sound to samples or how do you convert samples to a voltage? Sorry, convert a voltage to samples or convert samples to a voltage. Well, you do that with a conversion process of some kind using some fancy hardware. And so I'll talk very briefly here in a bit about how you do that and how that all works out. But that's a very short thing. Thanks for listening through all of this. I know it was a lot. I hope you'll stay safe out there and I will talk to you again very soon.